Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can I please get a thumbs up if you can all hear me and if you can all see my screen? Yes, we can hear you. We can see your screen. Thank you. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this webinar today. Apologies for the technical glitch we have, which has resulted in us starting a few minutes later. Uh, but once again, thank you for sacrificing your time, your lunch, wherever you may be. Um, and we hope to have um, a worthwhile and fruitful um, discussion today. I'd like to, first of all, thank all the panelists um, who have joined us today. Um, thank you also for your, for your contributions, as well as um, your preparation and your time to be with us. Um, we have a very diverse panel with us covering all through from the pipeline. So um, our academics um, at university, going through all the way to our regulating and voluntary associations. Um, we've got SICE represented here. Um, and to all our practicing professionals um, involved in mentoring, um, involved in um, um, training, and developing um, all the female um, engineers, uh, which is the specific talk for today. So I'm just gonna um, share a few slides as the facilitator today, just to break the ice, um, set the scene before I hand over to my panelists. So um, from my side, um, just quick introduction and what brings me here today, what qualifies me to be facilitating this webinar on gender mainstreaming um, is that I'm a CESA board member and recently um, appointed or tasked with chairing um, the Transformation Development Committee. I'm personally, director and chairman of Jones and Wagner, where I head up the Waste Engineering Department. I'm a professional engineer, registered in 2010, so I'm just revealing my age here. Um, and I've been practicing in the field of waste engineering um, for 18 years. Um, my real, real job um, and my real bosses is my two handsome boys um, who basically um, run my life outside of my engineering practice. So, you know, when we um, embarked on having a talk um, on Women's Month, about gender equality. We got a few messages and um, some people asking, why is this still um, a topic in 2023? Um, why are we still doing the same, same? Um, and up, up to when is this gonna be a need? The thing is the statistics show that there is a need um, from EXA to CESA to SISI from workplace, um, we can see that there is still a need for transformation in our industry. Um, we do acknowledge, however, that a lot of progress has been made over the years, but there's still um, opportunity and, and, and chance to, to grow this. Um, it is important to broaden um, women's equitable participation at all levels of decision making, because um, research shows that where women are involved in decision making, um, better decisions are taken, more holistic approaches are taken, and it makes business sense to not exclude half the population um, in matters um, that um, involved um, the future of the um the full population per se. And also these talks are important so that we just don't accept it as a status quo um, and say, well, it's what it is in engineering or in STEM, um, female participation below. But it's important that we keep talking to prevent the perpetuation of inequality in our industry. And lastly, our stories matter. Um, and our stories help us encourage each other on this journey. Um, of um, diversity and inclusion. We learn more from experience and from testimonials per se, um, which show that um, it is possible and together we can uh, strive um, for a more um, diverse and inclusive industry. So just quickly looking at some stats, um, this is from the um, EXA report um, of 2021-2022. 
Um, and the numbers are clear. If, if you look at the top table there, which shows um, professional um, category registration um, by gender, if you look at the professional engineer category, you'll see that of the total um, professionally and um, professional engineers, um, less than 10% is female. Um, on the technologist side, which is quite interesting, there seems to be some gender equality there. And maybe we need to learn more in terms of how this has been achieved. Um, if you look at the professional certificated engineer, um, majority male, um, as well as in the technician um, um, category. And also, if you start looking at the pipeline at the bottom um, bar chart, in terms of um, the candidate registrations, um, you can see that um, the, the female um, registration numbers um, are lagging. Um, and it is important to have this discussion to understand why. What I'm sharing right now is the CESAR stats um, based on information that we receive from our 581 member firms. Um, and this again, um, split into various categories in terms of top management, senior management. So that would be all your technical directors, associates, et cetera. And professional would mean um, anyone who is uh, professionally registered and above. Um, and, and while the numbers do um, improve, um, there's still um, quite um, low participation um, of, of, of women, um, even at the professional level where only um, a quarter um, is um, female representatives and now taking it all the way up to top management where only 14% um, of females are participating um, at the C-level. So again, why do we need these discussions? because the numbers show um, that we um, need um, to have this continual discussion. So this is just another way of representing the numbers um, that I've just represented before. So to share my story, because our stories matter. Um, so I completed uh, my engineering degree at the University of Pretoria, finished my last exam in November. By 1st December, I was very ready and eager um, to start as a young engineer at Jones and Wagner. Um, I was assigned a mentor. We have a procedure here where um, a mentor is assigned outside of your department. This is just to make sure that your interests, um, the interests of your direct manager um, in terms of getting work done uh, do not um, overlook at the journey that you want to take as a um, on, on your road to registration. So that's why we have um, a mentor that, which is assigned in a different department who's got um, an independent view per se. So I was assigned a mentor. Um, in my case, um, it's, it's worth a mention. I know he won't be here, but Dr. Nico um, Vermeulen in our company, in our geotechnical um, department was my mentor. And it is a company requirement that we meet at least once um, every quarter. And Nico and I kept meeting and meeting. Um, and by early 2009, it was like, I think you're ready. And I wasn't, I didn't feel ready. And if it wasn't from a push from him, I would not have submitted. Um, so I, I basically took um, his lead and um, submitted my application at the end of 2009. And I was officially registered by May of the following year. So um, I've highlighted there because um, it's important that I stress that had my mentor um, not encouraged or pushed me um, to get to a level of submitting, I, I might not have felt ready. Um, and it's important um, in terms of um, that um, support um, company inside the company so that um, if you are feeling um, a bit um, unsure of your competence, someone else is able to highlight all the progress that you have made. And throughout this journey then of mentoring other females um, and speaking to some colleagues, um, the things I've heard um, are hindering or um, stopping females from pursuing registration is because they are waiting until everything is now 100% perfect, 
there's this um, spirit of um, I don't want there to be any doubt. And, and that's why maybe um, there ends up being either a delay or someone eventually deciding, listen, I'm not cut for this, I'm not going to do it. There's also um, this imposter syndrome of doubting um, your own competence um, and looking at others maybe who have not registered um, and thinking, well, if they have not done it, um, who am I? And not realizing that there may be other reasons that others are not um, registering. Um, what I'm hearing again as one of the hindrances is um, opportunity for site work in order to gain that type of experience. Um, and also um, in terms of opportunity to function at a performing level that is required for registration. Um, I'm hearing some client biases in terms of when a female takes the lead, um, unlike the male counterpart where um, respect is almost automatic um, and females need to work harder to earn it, um, that is a bit of a, a hindrance. Uh, and also some company cultures that might not give um, juniors more opportunity to take the lead in meetings, um, to um, attend to client um, meetings um, with lesser supervision. So those are just um, a few things that I'd like to note. And with that, um, I would like to now open up to our panel um, and give them an opportunity to um, set the scene, um, introduce themselves, and I encourage you during this time as they are speaking to please um, drop your questions, drop your comments um, in the Q&A so that we are able to um, start discussing those and engaging with you um, after all the um, panelists have had an opportunity to speak. Um, with that, I'm going to stop um, sharing and um, I will like to give um, introduction. Um, to our first speaker. Um, very happy and delighted to have with us new from the box CEO of SAISI, um, Sikadi Payane, um, and I'll give her opportunity to introduce herself um, and to also share her presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope my presentation is on the screen. Um, my name is Sigadi Pajani. Thank you very much, um, Jabu Shahani. And as uh, Jabu said, I'm new from the box. I'm the SIC CEO. I'm a professionally registered engineer. I have a master's in transport engineering with over 20 years experience, mainly from the consulting engineering space. I'm a wife to two very young and naughty babies and have one husband. Um, I'm honored to be able to come and speak to you um, on this particular topic uh, on behalf of SAISI, and I'll be going uh, quite quickly over our current statistics within the organization, the challenges that we are facing, and in terms of what we are doing as SAISI in terms of diversity and inclusivity. Um, the state of gender inequality in engineering and built environment is staggering. And even though there's a lot of work that is being done to attract uh, women to our industries and retain them, uh, to ensure that uh, they go through the, uh, the whole career path to being professionally registered, um, you know, the retention of women requires greater effort. And uh, our industry is facing what is termed as a leaky pipeline where women leave the industry at different stages of development. And the responsibility lies on us to change this narrative. And of course, noting that it's not just us women, but with our colleagues as well, uh, who are not absolved from their responsibilities. It is reassuring to see an increase in females in our industry in recent years, uh, which is redefining the typical image of who belongs in our industry. However, change is coming quite slowly. As far as size is concerned, we are bleeding members, especially in the age 26 to 35 year old who are leaving SISI or leaving the country in pursuit of other um, ventures. And um, as you can see on the slide, 25% of the members we are losing are female. Um, in terms of our membership base, 20% um, of SICE members are female. And I mean, out of 15,000 members, that is still quite a low amount. We only have about 3,000 women within SICE membership. Um, on this slide, we have more student members than actual professionals. You'll see on the right hand side, it's more the student engineers, technicians and technologists. And then the professionally registered engineers and technologists 
account for a very small, small percentage. Uh, we are struggling with converting um, students from to be students to associate members who have graduated to then converting them to be professionally registered engineers and technologists. Industry figures are a little bit encouraging. Uh, this is a study that was done with public um, public industry. And uh, we're from 2005 to 2015, there's been a, an improvement in the amount of female engineers, technologists, and technicians uh, in the public sector um, in the age of 25 to 34 and in the age of 35 to 49, and also above 50 and above, unlike with the men. So in terms of the challenges that uh, I believe, or we believe as I see that women are going through, there was also a New York Times article that detailed at considerable length the kinds of discrimination, obstacles, and other difficulties that women face um, from professors who discourage them from continuing in engineering professions to difficulty combining careers and a personal life. And um, even though I must admit that I, I never really got to see that in my own career, um, there have been some biases that I've had to counteract as I uh, worked through this industry. And when we consider the challenge of gender equality in context, there are a myriad of challenges, one of them being organizational cultures, which are neither committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, unconscious bias, that which is what I've experienced a lot, and stereotyping where women are not afforded similar opportunities as their male counterparts, human resource practices that marginalize women, um, including decisions on hiring, promotions, work assignments, especially in engineering, employment conditions that do not cater for diverse needs. Sometimes uh, we require flexible working hours and looking at um, equitable maternity leave policies, actually where women can re-enter the workforce. Uh, pay inequities, which uh, can sometimes make our engineering industry uh, unappealing for women and and some women remain underpaid at different levels. Uh, lack of equitable mentorship, sponsorship, champions and advocates, which is what Jabu was talking about, that um, not every uh, female engineer has been afforded that and therefore the retention statistics are low. And the concept of inclusion is also a mystery in many workplaces where diversity is easier to achieve. You know, So true inclusion requires complete wiring and even though these challenges are immense, you know, there is a part that we can play to change the narrative. So what is SICE doing is we have uh, a dedicated diversity inclusivity panel where we want to facilitate input on diversity inclusivity challenges and through various, various options. And that is we are articulating our commitment to our members and our industry to diversify and be inclusive. And we believe that we need to take part in the conversation uh, with our members and the industry will follow. Uh, we are advocating for the inclusion of women and increasing visibility of women as role models and celebration of women's achievements. Because Marian Walters once said, you can't be what you can't see. So we are advocating for more females in our committees. The ex-president was a female. Uh, we having student chapter, uh, chairpersons being female, divisions, uh, chairpersons being female, encouraging more female to come and be part of the executive board. Uh, we've also taken a strategic decision to increase the number of SICE fellows who are women in 2023. So far, we have about seven. Um, that have been nominated in 2022, we only had one. So um, we have also want um, DNI to be woven within the organization where we're having targeted events and initiatives uh, with young members, and this should be part of the annual calendar. And then we also supporting research by academics, World Bank on gender diversity, and ensuring that we are publishing these thought pieces in our magazine and our journal and going forward and our newsletters as well and raising awareness. Uh, we're working on relevant training material and courses relating to diversity and inclusion topics uh, for industry. And um, some of it 
also including virtual site work, site work that we are trying to set up within the CIC offices. And our involvement in the CBE's Gender Equality Collaborative Committee also allows us to have a voice in terms of influencing policy. We have made some of these strides as CIC, but still argue that more needs to be done. We are part of our partnership on the WIDBE initiative, uh, which is a partnership and a program for structured social learning, uh, which we have once a month, and it's open to all women in the built environment um, and then and then we, as I see as I said we have made some strides but still argue that more more needs to be done so um, in closing I just want to say this is a journey indeed and we wish to continue walking this with our members in this journey and with CISA and encouraging us to always do better thank you very much for your time Thank you very much, Sikadi. Um, I think that was brilliant. I, I, I just want to add that um, Sikadi is only with us until one o'clock. So um, if there are particular questions related um, to SICE, um and the SICE stats, as well as the initiatives, can you please pop them in the Q&A because she'll be able to just leave us some answers there before she leaves. Um, but thank you very much. It's very encouraging to see everything that the SICE is doing. Um, and we do um, see the visibility um, of SICE um, through all the um, social media campaigns as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, our next speaker is um, Karen um, Janssen van Rensburg, um, who is um, a lecturer um, at University of Pretoria. And I'll give her um, a chance to share her screen um, as well as introduce herself um, better than I have. Karen, over to you. Thank you so much, Abilali. Um, So good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, I'm Karen and I'm a, a lecturer at the University of Pretoria, like she said. Um, I've got more than 20 years experience in the industry. I'm, I, um, I'm a civil engineer and I started in consulting. Then I moved over to the construction industry, which I enjoyed a lot. Um, and we can speak a lot about that and how women fit in there. Um, and then I went a little bit more into environmental engineering and project management. But my really my true passion is acad not academics like research, but I love, I love, I love teaching. And that is why I'm at the university. Um, I've got three kids, um, all at school still. And and so yeah, uh, it's basically that I think that takes anyone whose kids will know that takes up quite a lot of time. Okay, so I would just like to say that's a little bit of feed or just um, some background. I think one thing that is very important for me to say before we go any further, and I think that is why it qualifies me to be on this panel. So even with 20 years experience, I am one of those women that have not registered yet. And there's quite a few reasons for that. Um, you know, the challenges that I faced and 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 I'll I'll deal with that just now. But I first wanted to share some stats with you from the university side. So it's quite interesting to see um, after the stats that we've seen. Um, so keep in mind, this is, let me just share my screen, screen quickly. Keep in mind, this is obviously the pipeline of, of where the engineers are coming from. Um, so this was for our yearly, um, let me just see that I can see my own screen here. So uh, we yearly that we have to get, give feedback to our, um, you know, to the advisory board, industry advisory board. So if we look at this, um, you know, numbers, I'm not going to go into detail, obviously, this just breaks down, um, although I'm a civil engineer, uh, we obviously worry about what happens in the other engineering departments as well. So numbers wise, um, yeah, we we are about at 1,600. We are one of the biggest departments in, in the country. When it, um, not departments really, when it comes to the faculty of, of engineering. So you can see it's about, uh, you know, the turn is about, uh, you know, 1,800 students. Okay, so we see a small decline um at the moment but but not really something that we feel we need to be worried about 
if we have a look at a uh, male female ratio um th this is not you can see nothing has changed over the years we are talking about 25 percent uh women have always you can see from 2011 it picked up i remember in my class i think we were four ladies out of 25 but once again if you look at the numbers we we are close to 20 25 percent so so um I think what's difficult, if we look at the numbers at SICE, for example, as well, it's just because there are less women to start with. Um, that means that that there will be less that you know that that that's pro possibly going to register. Um, so if I have to talk, I'm just going to leave that slide there. So so to talk about my personal challenges, I think there's two main things that happen. Is firstly, if we talk about your personal life or my personal life, for example, is the easiest way to register is to do it, I'm going to say it, is to do it before you have kids. Okay, so there's no easy way about that. Um, we are still in the society today, I think we are still expected to be superwomen. We have full-time jobs, we still have to run our households, then when you get kids, you still have to, you know, make sure your kids are in the right place at the right time. If you've got, if you've got animals like I've got a zoo here, I still have to worry that if if everything here has got stuff to eat. So, so just being a a, a superwoman on a daily basis, um, something's got to give. So you have to decide, and and that's the thing. Personally, for me, I've always been a person I want to enjoy my work but work is not first priority for me. So if I have to cut somewhere, I'm not going to cut down on the time with my kids. So, so that's why I'm saying the easiest for, for young women, hopefully listening, is try and get it done as soon as possible. Um, from Jabalile's journey as well, where she said, the problem is sometimes we feel we are not ready for it. Um, and that's that may be what affects you. But the sooner you get it done, really, the easier it will be. And then the second thing um, that that I found me moving from consulting, going into construction, then um, I've worked in the project management field as well. Um, the, your big uh, one of the big things is if you and I've been with very good companies. So so this is not a reflection on my, any companies that I've worked for at all. But I think your company view on, on EXA and the support that they give you is basically what's going to push it through. So like Jones and these companies out there that's got amazing, amazing um, um, you know, support programs. We've got Herman here that will tell you a little bit more of being him being the mentor of the year. But the big thing is so for where I'm working at the moment, it's not really, um, yes, they want us to be EXA registered. There's no drive from my current workplace for me to be registered. So I think, um, so finding a mentor is obviously very important to start with, I think. Um, but if you have support from your company, that is, I think, what's going to really make a difference for you. So that's all from my side for now, Jabalili. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, very um, interesting views you have there. Um, and great to see these numbers um, from UP um, in terms of um, at least percentages higher than 20 um, of intake and those completing. Um, it's, it's really good to see the pipeline that we have um, for the future. And hopefully we can retain them in the industry um, and not lose them to consulting, um, management, et cetera. But yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there's going to be questions, um, especially um, on your personal um, experience and motherhood, um, because those have come up as well. So just to move along then to um, our next panelist, um, I'd like to introduce Mishak, um, who is a lecturer um, at TUT. Um, and he will also just share with us on um, the um, technicians, technologists um, practice um, and um, the um, stats in terms of um, demographics um, at TUT. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mashek. Uh, 
program director, I'm not seeing him. Maybe let uh, skip him. I'm going to try to get hold of him. All right. No, thank you. Um, I guess we've lost him there. Not a problem. Um, we'll move over then to um, Marilee Boerta. Marilee is um, also newest from the box. Um, congratulations to you on your award last week. She is the 2023 Young Engineer um, of the Year. Um, she is a technical director at Zutari, um, a mechanical engineer. But um, Marilee, I'll give over to you as well to introduce yourself and share your story. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so like like I was introduced, my name is Marilee Bueta, and um, I actually I have a history in chemical engineering and I have a master's degree in, in environmental engineering. So that is quite a passion for me. I do have my PRNG and I guess that's a big discussion that's going on today here. And I'm also PMP registered, but I think most importantly, I'm a mother to a little girl who is about seven months old now. And um, yes, that is, that is a big responsibility. And I think Again, the female in engineering topic just brings that so much closer to our heart because looking at the future, where it's going to go, um, very, very interesting. And obviously then being an engineer, I had to do the engineering thing. And when, when I started thinking about this topic, I had to go down the rabbit hole, right? And start looking at all the numbers. So I think I'm just gonna take this moment just to talk through a couple of studies that I read up on. And it just really is, such a complicated issue, much more complicated than I thought it was when I just heard about the topic of females in engineering. So let's let's go. Um, so starting at the start, which industries are actually dominated by women? Okay, so that is the medical industry, the education industry, beauty, diet and nutrition, and customer services. So that again, a lot of social, very like people oriented jobs, right? Which industries are dominated by men? So obviously STEM comes to mind. And even though that is actually the way that the world thinks, to be honest, it's rather the EM part of STEM that is really dominated by men. Internationally, there's quite a number of women in science and technology, but very few in, in engineering and in mathematics. So the fields of biology and chemistry are actually dominated by women internationally. Okay, so let's dig even deeper. I was reading up and man, like I said, rabbit hole. So the first study was on male and female achievements and the choices in school based on international standardized testing schools. So in high school, females actually tend to outperform males when it comes to language based subjects. And this is now just generalizing. I know this, there are a lot of people where this is different, but this is statistics. So it's just generalizing male students tend to have higher marks in math and science compared to their own language scores, typically. And then for this reason, actually a lot of male students choose to study math and science based degrees um, where the female choices are much more varied. So there are a lot of females going into the same type of subjects, but also a lot of females going into more um, language based subjects. And now this one is interesting and I, I I'm still trying to digest it. I'm not sure what to make of it, but there was an international study done on the number of women in STEM versus the level of gender inequality in a country. And weirdly, they actually found that the higher the level of gender inequality in a country, the higher the number of women in STEM careers. So that is a weird one. But the logic here was that women tend, are more willing to take on certain jobs that they perceive to be paying higher if there is more of an economic pressure on them. So if there's a economic security, it tends to be more varied. Um, and I mean, I guess we can make what we want of that one, but that is really interesting for me. So that brings a whole new topic to the table, right? Um, how do we feel about the freedom of choice side of this? And also, what are we chasing? So here, with obviously with women in STEM, what I would like to understand from my own perspective and from everybody on the call is how do we measure women in STEM type of careers? Are we chasing a 50-50% male and female? Or are we looking for a scenario where women can choose what they want to do? Any position without bias, without discrimination, without having a false image of what a woman in STEM needs to look like or needs to be. Um, so basically, rather than a, an exact number, perhaps we should be chasing an enabling environment where if a woman wants to study STEM, there must be no reason for them not to do so. 
so I will leave that one to you. So that that is that is an interesting, I think, topic that looks, takes us a little bit away from the numbers. But then let's move back to South Africa. I had a bit of a chat. I was reaching out to a couple of universities and it was actually quite interesting because people were quite willing to talk about this topic and where they're going. I think, Corin, so interesting what you were sharing as well earlier. And you'll you'll see, I think my numbers are actually exactly the same. So um, the typical type of numbers that they actually gave me for people who are applying to study for engineering, that's now not the people actually studying, but who apply, so it shows interest, is around 25% of the students are actually female. and. The most popular choice for ladies at the moment still remain chemical engineering and industrial engineering, but it has changed a little bit over the last couple of years. Actually, chemical and industrial engineering have the numbers of females have reduced a little bit while all other disciplines have increased, most notably mechanical engineering, which is really, really interesting. So the spread of females between disciplines have changed. However, at the moment, if you look at the industry numbers, there are only 7% of engineers and in industry that are women in South Africa. So how at the moment can we really chase a 50% EXO registration if only 7% of women in, in industry are female? And that's a really difficult one. And I mean, it introduces another issue as well. As you heard, 25% of, of the females want to study engineering, but only 7% are practicing. What's happening here? So we know now that women are perhaps less likely to choose STEM, sure, but why do they move out of the career? Like, is it a perception? Are there still some level of discrimination in this field, which is something that it cannot be? We need to stump that out. Um, or is it simply something that they enjoy less than other more people-driven careers? Um, and if that is the case, I mean, that's, that's one of those things. But again, it has to do with education. So is it something we can address? Can we teach our kids that STEM-based careers can be just as fun, creative, and people-driven than some other careers that are perhaps more popular for females at the moment? Well, I think we should, honestly. And yeah, to conclude, just on this whole monologue, I would love for somebody on the school to actually put up their hand and do a PhD on the subject because it is very, very interesting. And it actually goes very deep. It's much more complicated than we think. So yeah, with that, back over to you, <laughs> Chavalile. <laughs> Thank you very much, Riley. Um, and yeah, I think you, like you said, a rabbit hole, which you bring <laughs> across some interesting arguments or um, thought provoking for, um, stats um, and questions. Are, are we chasing 50 50? Is, is it reasonable to chase 50 50 when we can see the numbers that we have um, at the um, tertiary institutions? Um, in fact, I, I did a visit to some schools that were supporting high schools, and the shocking numbers of students that are doing pure maths um, and what is available then um, to move into not just engineering studies, um, but other medical, um, um, financial, et cetera, that require pure maths. We, we're competing for a very small um, number of high school graduates um, with pure maths. And um, is 50-50 realistic? I guess it will come up um, in the discussions that we're gonna have. Um, let's then move over to our next speaker, which is um, Darren Pillay. Um, and Darren is from Knight Peasalt, and he was runner up of um, the 2023 CESAR Young Engineer of the Year. Over to you, Darren. Thank you. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, can hear you. Perfect, can see okay. your slides. Good, good. So, Darren Play, um, yeah, did come in either second or third place there. But he's a young engineer of the year award. Well done, Marley. Uh, just about myself, I'm a principal bridge of structural engineer at Knight Peasold. Um, I'm a professional engineer, 13 years of experience. Um, I'm also on the CISA Transformation and Development Committee, CISA QRS Committee, as well as the more important and somewhat close to my heart, the SICE success through academic readiness. So I'm the champion of the SICE star. And the, the perspective of that is the promotion of STEM and engineering at high school level. Uh, basically, you're trying to get down to the root cause of what is going on. 
um, just want to share. So just on the left is is just myself just presenting at one of the local schools here in Johannesburg, just making or creating awareness of STEM to the to the learners. Um, during that process, my team um, we we ran through all the stats in South Africa, basically from the Department of Education as well. And the scary fact of it is the majority of the marks that are coming out of high school learners at the moment are sitting way below what they are allowed to in terms of applying for engineering degrees or at the universities. So I believe like the minimum is about 60% throughout all the tertiary institutions. And you can see just on the screen, we, we're sitting at 60%. We're looking for the maths on the top. Um, just in 2021, 4.7% of, of all learners were hitting around about the 60%. So you'll just see the, the very big decline going from the 60 to the 100% where you're losing a lot of students already in the engineering space. Similarly, with the science, it was a little bit better. You have a higher percentage uh, doing the technical sciences. Now, these two graphs are purely the, the pure maths, pure sciences. So you, you're just purely looking at, we don't have that many people coming through the system. So that's the importance of this IC star, just to make awareness, awareness, just try to push students or learners just to at least engage better in their maths and, and technical sciences, just to afford them opportunities. A lot of the students that we met on that day weren't aware of the entry requirements from a young age. So the grade eight, from the grade 10s and 11s, they, they weren't aware you needed at least 60%. So they they were just happy with their pass and, and that was it. Um, just with that, I've recently heard that Red Hill School, what they're doing at the moment is they've introduced a STEM education program within their own school. So well done to them. So essentially they, they created a curriculum for them where they can engage in STEM, understand STEM, as well as be, a, be aware of STEM and engineering. So it, it's a possibly a way forward that we can take back into the government schools. We have at least a school that's trying it out now. Um, as well as the SICE style. So what we've done is we've prepared a presentation on STEM and engineering. Currently, it's just based on civil engineering, but we're looking forward to engaging with the other engineering communities and, and putting a full-on a holistic engineering presentation together. The current plan is to go back to the Department of Education and get it, the, the presentation in a video form and distribute it to every school in, in the country. Just so more awareness is the, is the biggest role that we want to achieve from this IC star initiative. Now, my big pain or, or goal in, in, in engineering as a whole is just meritocracy. So it doesn't matter if you're male or female, if you're in the right position and you have the right qualifications for the job, then perfect. It shouldn't matter on gender, on race, on any other thing. If you are the right person for the job, then that's perfect. The country will get a lot further than what we are at today. Now I've put this image on the screen because my wife complains that she has a thousand things to think of and I'm just thinking about work, which is like 99% not true. But there's a lot of bar different barriers for women. And I, I've seen that in my wife. She's not in the engineering field, but she's in telecommunications and, and she is doing very similar type of STEM-related work. But her processes in, in terms of thinking she has so much more on her plate than what I think she actually has. Apologies to her, but it, it's the truth. So in terms of my perspective, it's more of changing mentality. Um, males can definitely pick up more slack at home. I know, Karen, you, you said it as well now. You have a lot more to things to think about, as well as trying to get balance between, between the roles. Um, I think I'm a good dad, but obviously... I can, um, there's a lot of slack I can pick up with the process. Yeah, I think that was my last slide. So thank you very much. Thank you, Darren. Um, 
yeah, it's the, the first time I hear the word meritocracy. So um, learn something new today. So again, based on the numbers that you've presented and size star, um, the thing that just keeps coming back to me is grassroots, right? Um, we need to solve this at the grassroots level. And some of our initiatives have focused on high school learners, but only around the grade 11, grade 12 mark. And maybe something to keep for further discussion, but could be a bit late. Um, we should be targeting initiatives on grade eight, grade nine, um, where the love for maths and the reasons why um, the students should continue with pure maths and endure, um, that's where um, we can then start increasing um, and, and broadening um, the, the pipeline. But yeah, that's, that's, that's for the next discussion, I guess. Um, we're almost done with our panel introductions and um, thank you to everyone. I can see the questions are coming through in the chat um, as well as the Q&A and um, we'll, we'll, we'll try and address that um, in about two presentations to go. For now, I'd like to um, go back to um, Mishak um, from TUT. Do you, are you there? Are you ready? Yes, um, thank you very much, I'm ready. Um, my name is Musiman Kapa Mishak Mokai. Um, I'm a lecturer at um, Tony University of Technology. I've got 12 years of experience in the industry. Um, I basically started working for a female engineer um, 12 years ago. Um, as a consultant, um, Ms. Levole Shavani, so uh, basically this topic excites me because she was one woman that was very passionate about engineering and basically, um, you know, right now she has grown up um, over and she's, I think, now the CEO of IX Engineers. Um, so I'm a, I'm a transportation engineer, I've got a master's in transportation engineering, um, and um, I'm unfortunately registered as a candidate with um, EXA, but I'm, a, I'm registered as a PRCPM um, with SACPMP. Um, now, my um, experience basically, you know, with uh, female um, engineer, I mean, female engineers and everything like that is derived primarily from having a CEO who was um, a female from the beginning and who was very passionate about um, you know, the field of engineering and basically looking for young people so that they can excel in everything like that. And basically one of the passions that I derived and going back to the university and teaching again is from, from, from that perspective of basically, you know, looking at somebody who's so passionate about the youth, female and male, who basically wanted to um, do good for, 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 for that. Um, now, um, as in TUT, I mean, I started uh, working at uh, Universe Technology eight years ago, and um, the number of females has increased, um, certainly, uh, but you still get circumstances where uh, females are basically, you know, um, much lower in numbers than, uh, than males. I mean, I've got an example of a class where I've got about 30 students in the class, and five of those students are, are, are female. So basically you still get uh, um, those, those, those kind of things. And I, I believe that um, you know, working with communities and schools and everything like that is one thing that can change um, you know, the narrative of female, um, you know, females trying to get into um, this basis of becoming engineers and so on and so forth. And I've highlighted three challenges that um, basically I think are they in the industry and both um, in the world. Uh, for, for female um, engineers. I mean, it's stereotype, first of all. Engineering is seen as a very male-dominated industry, and the stereotype needs to be uh, basically, um, you know, challenge, be challenged that engineering can be a female-dominated industry. Um, and we've, we've got examples of a lot of females who are doing very, very good in the, um, yeah, um, in the industry. Another thing is social expectations. I mean, um, obviously, um, you know, the way that we have been programmed or the world has been programmed, um, that engineering is a very male-dominated um, industry and everything like that needs to be changed. And I think it starts with the universities, it starts with schools, it starts with mentors, it starts with the females that are 
uh, basically practicing at the moment that they can derive and drive the message back to community communities and, uh, and, 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 and to students. And the other thing um, I think is, is role, um, lack of role models, um, lack of female role models. Um, you know, as, as much as, um, you know, um, there, there, there is um, will and uh, um, an expectation of, 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 of people to say that, you know, they, they'll be motivated by looking at, at people. Maybe it's time that, um, you know, a lot of um, successful um, female um, um, uh, engineers go back to the grassroots, um, not only at grade 10 and grade 11, but, you know, it starts at grade eight, where basically, you know, they showcase their skills, showcase what they've done um, in high schools. And obviously then, um, you know, that um, female um, uh, 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 um, uh, children can grow up knowing that they can have expectancy um, in the, uh, and, and, and a, a very good um you know, a uh, future in engineering. Rather than like, you know, when I grew up, uh, first, uh, the first thing that our parents used to tell us is that, you know, you needed to become a lawyer or you needed to become a medical doctor. That was the only thing that we had at the beginning. And, and, and it's time that maybe uh, young children and young females, they start hearing that they can become engineers um, and, and so on and so forth. Now, um, with Sony University of Technology, um, uh, you know, which is my current employers, um, uh, we are fortunate enough that um, the department offers opportunities for lecturers basically to uh, who want to be involved in industry, you know, um, to, to, to motivate uh, for their registration that they can be linked with companies and those companies basically can assist them with registration. Um, you know, um, uh, or be uh, or mentorships basically, uh, because um, according to the new EXA guidelines, um, unfortunately, all unfortunately, or fortunately, basically, all lectures need to be registered um, uh, for uh, with EXA as, as 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 professionals. And 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 TUT or the Department of Civil Engineering has taken an initiative basically now to try and assist um, lecturers with registration. And, and 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 so on so on. so I, I i think that that is a good thing um and in terms of numbers unfortunately we've got only two female lecturers uh, out of 23 lecturers in our department which is not good um and that basically um it talks to um what we are talking about right now to say that we need a lot more motivation for um you know in academia and both also in industry that female teachers must get involved thank you very much appreciate it Thank you very much, uh, Mishak. Um, I think what came through quite a lot in your talk is the need for role models, um, the way you fondly spoke about label and the impact she had on you, um, as well as what you're saying that you're seeing with the students in terms of a need um, for female um, role models. Personally, um, when I started studying engineering, I, I didn't um, know of uh, a female civil engineer. Um, luckily, at that stage, we had um, at UP, um, Dr. Bridget Samula, who's now their um, ex-CEO, she was part of the staff. And that was great because finally, um, a female engineer and a Black female engineer, um, because when we start going into race as well, the numbers start getting less. And coming to the workplace, um, doing um, an engineering that is different because now it's like geotech, but waste engineering looking for um, mentors there was difficult. And um, luckily, Riva um, Nopia, who, who is here with us, um, was someone you could say, OK, it's possible. So um, very important, um, the, the the need for role modeling um, and, and, and where uh, maybe um, even SISI um, and, and um, CISA advocacy could, could, could assist in terms of um, more visibility of female role models. But thank you very much for that. And our last speaker, um, and very important um, in terms of the road to registration, we have um, Harman Kronia, who is the 2023 CISA Mentor of the Year. Congratulations to you. Um, Herman is at SMIC, um, where he's currently um, a section manager for roads and highways. Over to you, Herman. Thank you so much. Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just uh, share my screen. All right. Okay. So as uh, Jabalila said, my name is Herman Kronia. Um, I'm based here in beautiful Cape Town, and I'm very honored to be a part 
of this panel on this important topic today. I'm, I'm really very glad Karen uh, brought up Superwoman and Marily brought up the rabbit hole because I'm about to take you a bit deeper into this rabbit hole. Um, my next slide might be might be a, a bit bright and might be the brightest colors a lot of you ever had on your computers. So brace your eyes. But in the spirit of Women's Month, I'd like to start with what might have been many girls' first inspiration and role model, Barbie. Now, did you know Barbie first wore a spacesuit, an astronaut suit, in 1965? Now, at that time, people still thought women wouldn't survive going to space because they're fragile. This was 18 years before America sent the first woman to space. Now, you might wonder why a male in a male-dominated industry is talking about Barbie. So when I was three or four years old, I sometimes played Barbie with my older sister. Now, I loved it. And I'm still not sure if it was out of free will or if my sister forced me. But I was soon taught boys don't play with dolls. Now, do you think a four-year-old could understand that? So this topic is much bigger and much more complex than just, you know, in the STEM careers. This is society. And, you know, stopping to play with Barbie um, to my sister's dismay was the first introduction I had to society's unwritten script and gender biases. Now, because you won't ever ask a girl how boys feel if they are told not to play with Barbie, I knew the challenges faced by women should be voiced by women, not by me. So I asked the ladies in my team and some of my colleagues to send me what they regard as the main challenges. So from Erlene van der Spey, she's a young engineer in our geometric department, and she feels that an environment where men act superior can make it feel imposing. So they almost hold back to registering, not to put themselves in there. Fear of being steamrolled into making decisions they're not comfortable with. Some women know their career path might be interrupted when starting a family. And then lastly, women might be hesitant to register due to being afraid to work on site and gain site experience. From Laura Ashley, she's also in our geometric department. He says, the industry was designed by men for men. Women are expected to adjust. And she brings up something that I, I think is very true, the bro code. Uh, there are a lot of social events and sporting events where men go and they use these as network opportunities. And this often uh, excludes a lot of women. So she also gave some formulas here. Men plus partner plus kids equals stable and secure. Good for business. Women plus partner plus kids, liability, greater household responsibility. So, you know, th these topics we are, we are um, stereotyping here and we're generalizing. But I think this is true. We have to understand what are the broader problems um, that we're facing so we can start to tackle them. She also says, and I agree with this, fundamental differences between how, how women and men think and how they communicate. And then also, as the previous panelists mentioned, uh, lack of presentation within the workplace. And this one is, uh, hopefully, it is starting to, to fade. Um, but men that are assertive and take charge is seen as powerful but women with the same characteristics are labeled as bossy. And then lastly, men tend to get promoted for their potential and men, uh, women tend to get promoted for their track record. Now, ladies and gentlemen, regardless of whether this is true or not, this is the perception of an individual 
And this might be a perception of a lot of young female people in the, in the STEM uh, career path. Lastly, oh, sorry, sorry. Second to last, Mishka Arendorf. Again, lack of presentation, representation. There's a biasness towards males in our industry. Again, safety issues on site. And then the patriarchal structure of society. Women's roles at home are much more demanding. And then what Mishka mentioned here is the type of leadership in the workplace. Leadership styles should be adjusted um, depending on who you're leading. And if there's a very strong um, typical male leadership in place, it should be adjusted if there are women in that workplace. From Carla Rom, and this is the last uh, colleague of mine who gave some inputs, female representation in STEM. And you can see this coming through again and again and again. So we're looking for those role models. We're looking for the Barbie doll. We're looking for someone they can look up to. Um, and because the numbers are so low, there are very few to look up to. And as we saw in the numbers at management level, it's still very male dominated industry. So the women that are in the industry have to realize this. They have to realize that they are role models, regardless if they want to be or not. And unfortunately, this is a pressure that gets put on women, but, and I'll chat about that a bit later, you ladies are built for this. And the decades and decades and decades of progress proves that. Another issue is typical work environment hasn't really changed. There's, we still have a 40 hour work week and maybe not a lot of flexibility for women who have other um, obligations at home. So with that, uh, Jabalile, I will stop here and uh, take it on later again. Thank you, Herman. Um, it is Bobby, yeah. <laughs> um, and thanks for um, that presentation and um, the research that has gone into it in terms of hearing um, from the female staff at your organization. Um, I think what everyone wants is to know that they matter, that they are heard, um, and that their opinion um, is important. I will start... Um, with the questions um, from the um, last speaker, um, Herman, there's a question here about um, female mentorship and whether female engineers should be pursuing mentorship from female engineers. Um, I'd like your take on that. Jabalile, so I would say yes and no. I would say there is a role, and, and I will speak about it a bit later on again, there's a role for men to play, to assist purely because of the numbers. There aren't enough role models or mentors in the industry um, you know, to give each lady a, a mentor, a female mentor. So men have a role to play and to they need to be trained to, um, you know, address this issue and candidly speak about this issue and bring it up with their female mentees. But we must also be sensitive to the fact that if there is not a female mentor um, available, that you as a male mentor find someone, find a strong female that is a mentor that has gone through uh, these experiences that you can put your mentee in touch with. No, I think that's a great answer. Um, and I think we should also um, not think about mentorship as something that is only within the organization or where you currently work, per se, um, and that we could pursue mentorship outside of that. Um, thanks for that answer. I just want to ask, um, a, a lot has come up with regards to the additional female load um, in terms of, again, um, societal pressure, um, in terms of 
um, in equity um, of housework and house roles. And I want to pose this question to Marilee, um, who is um, a new mom. Um, and I just want to hear from you how your experience has been, because you, you're young, you're up and coming, and you, you're doing, um, taking quite a lot of responsibility in terms of your work at Sutari um, and leading a team there. Um, how has this um, journey into motherhood um, affected um, your prospects in terms of what you think is capable is, is 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 possible for the future? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, goodness, what what a loaded question, putting me on the spot now. So, <laughs> so with this one, um, to be honest, I I. I was very, very scared before um, on whether I should have kids or not, being quite career driven. And honestly, I didn't really think about it all that much until I was kind of at the age where I was like, oh, my goodness, if I don't have kids, I'm not going to have kids. So I need to have kids. Um, and it just it just never came up. And then I realized, OK, if I have children now, I will be off work for a couple of months. I will walk away and somebody else would have to take over my team I mean they can't just somebody would have to take it over and if I come back will I still have a role if I you know all those fears all those talks and actually so what Harman was saying is so so valid having mentors um, and especially in this case I have a couple of mentors who are actually males and they all told me nonsense go it will be fine you will come back we'll keep your spot warm for you <laughs> you'll be fine so I I was in a very fortunate position to have brilliant brilliant people in my life who actually really did um, come through on that um, it was it was scary on the one hand um, on the other hand priorities have obviously changed like there's there's nothing like a baby in your life right so she's taking over everything it's one of those things um, but Again, my, my husband, we had a lot of conversations about it. He is one of those people who really is actively involved with the parenting. And he's very much, we, we both have goals in our career. So he's very much aware of mine and he respects it as well. So we, we help one another out. So, so far, um, I think I've been very fortunate. I think it, it could have turned out differently as well. And this whole thing about, you know, women have to take time off and they have to step out of their careers to actually be able to have a family and men just don't. That is unfortunately a reality in South Africa, but it's not a reality everywhere. And it's a way of thinking. I think that we must start talking about this and start seeing um, if that is really, you know, the only way of doing it. And the reason I bring this up is it's, it's, a, it's a problem for women. It's also a problem for men, actually. Because, for example, in countries like Sweden, let me let me just use this example. There is a, um, both a male and a female will take maternity leave. It's a shared responsibility. In fact, both parents must take up to 60 days to look after the kid. In South Africa, if, if the male will say, I would like to be a stay at home dad, imagine the judgment from society. And I say this really like from a place of knowledge because my husband was joking about it quite a lot um you know tongue in the cheek because it's something that he was actually thinking about he would love to be there for the child and my goodness it it is not a socially accepted thing to say or to do so that is really something to think about and to talk about people should have choice that's what it comes down to yeah and i think this is a good time to also bring in um uh, karen um, there's been a lot of um, reaction to to what you said about um, why you didn't register and um, how raising kids um, has um, factored in, in, in your decision. Um, would you um, say that um, based on what Mishak was also sharing in terms of this requirement now for lectures to also register professionally, um, what's your take on that and are you going to pursue that? <laughs> Fortunately, my boss is not on here. <laughs> so, uh, no, so um, obviously, okay. Let me explain. So, so what happened with me in the you know in the last few years? So it, they they are now forcing or Exa is now forcing us to say I lecture mostly final year modules. So the feeling is, but if you're not Exa registered, how how can you teach? How can you teach students? Okay, so I I totally get that. And the problem is, and this is what I want to share with you, is if you're in my situation, 
the only thing that happens if you do not register or you if um you know in the end it is your career so so yes i've i've decided after 20 years that i am actually registered as a candidate engineer at the moment and it is unfortunately i would have done it a lot sooner let me just explain my situation if it would have made a difference to my pay i would have done it 15 years ago but but the thing is and 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 that's the thing so a lot of and i mean i've, I've seen some of the comments here as well um, I remember when, you know, I, I didn't get promoted as quickly, you know, as, as some of my male counterparts. Um, and I mean, like I said, I, I worked at companies that really, you know, they, they were driven to get women where they needed to go. But I also saw some of my other women colleagues um, really struggled with that. So I think to get back to your question, um, yeah, if you want to if, get promoted, um, then definitely that's something that you have to do. But I think I'm just, I'm 43 this year and and I've realized what is important to me now. So I, I also have to say, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be sad if I don't get it. If I die without the registration, I'll be okay with it. I don't think, like I said, but it is an it is an expectation. So I've taken it upon myself to just say yes. Um, it's a box that you need to tick, and you have to do it. I don't think it makes you a better engineer. And from a from an academic perspective, is um, do, do I now have liability if a student you know passes or not pass? Because that is in the in the registration is about liability. So so I'm not sure what my liability is if I'm registered as a as academia. But yeah, in the end, as hard it is as it is, ladies and gents, it is not something that that we have to do. No, thank you. Um, I really appreciate your your honesty, um, and um. Uh, like we said, we learn from our stories and it, it's good to 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 be vulnerable um, and honest. There's, there's power in that. Um, I, I would like to just latch on something you said about um, if it would have made a, a difference to your pay or um, your promotion prospects. Um, a lot of companies like ours, we have a professional registrate, registration incentive scheme. Um, where, you know, if you register within a certain period, you get a bonus and you get um, uh, automatic salary increase. And it also then opens doors for you to be able to move on um, to other levels um, in the company. Um, to the practicing um, engineers here, uh, maybe Darren, um, do you think such a, a scheme um, is... Um, inspirational or could it be causing other issues in terms of putting pressure um, in, in, in driving um, registration outcomes? Uh, well, just like in Karen's perspective, yes. It, it's worthwhile if you're a student and you have a lecturer that's, that's professionally registered, it, it holds more weight. And I've had that one experience when I was still at university where we had an industry expert come through and actually lecture us on geotech, which was it was great. He was insightful. He understood what he needed to do, how to teach, gave us examples. I think I've learned the most from him, even though I didn't end up going into geotech. But it, 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 it helps. Like every little bit helps. I think everyone on the panel is doing their little, little bit as well. Was, well, we can only just succeed together. Hmm. And would you say having um, a professional um, registration scheme at the workplace um, would drive up these um, female registration numbers? No, oh, well, just well, just looking at Night Peace itself, we have that scheme in, in internally as well. It comes down to the person. To be honest, you can you can try and force, you can try to put these programs and mentoring programs in place, but if the candidates don't want to engage themselves, just as an example for me, it took me like a year and a half to write my reports because I was never happy with what I actually wrote. So I could have been registered a year earlier, according to my manager, but I was never confident or happy with what I was putting out there. And it's a very hard thing to figure out unless you have the right mentorship. 
Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. No, and like you said, um, it, it it really comes down to the individual, right? Um, which which links to a question that um, maybe a comment rather that Linda uh, put in the Q and A, um, just just asking how how do we deal with um, apathy? You know, how can we promote the interest and enthusiasm um, and get more female participation in such discussions and 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 wanting to register. And it, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, um, the, the the role modeling that is our responsibility, not just as females, but even as mentors like Hartman, um, who can influence um, the young engineers and um, um, just, just, just make the professional registration more attractive. So I, I guess we all have a responsibility to play here. Um, I want to go back to one of the other themes that is recurring, um, and that has to do with the um, grassroots level. Um, and I want to pose this question to you, Mishak, um, as, as someone in academia. Um, what is being done in terms of um, going to the grassroots um, and promoting engineering and um, encouraging um, students or the entry level grade eight, grade nines to 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 take up your maths um, and um, pursue engineering um, as um, tertiary studies. Mishak? Um sorry Jabi, I didn't get that question um well. Um can you just um rephrase a bit? What is TUT doing to get more students into maths and eventually into engineering? Yeah, thank, thanks for that. So um, I'm, I'm, fortu I'm fortunate enough to be part of the, um, you know, um, um, community development um, team uh, for TUT. So what we do primarily is um, our department or the Department of Civil Engineering at TUT, we get involved in communities with the Department of Architecture, where we basically go to schools and um, offer something. For an example, you find that um, this year we are renovating a classroom with um, the help with um, the architectural department. So what we do, we go to schools, we tell them what we are, um, civil engineering department and that goes with structural engineering and this architecture. And, you know, it's, it's young people who are going there, they do a project for the school and they involve basically, you know, the, the, the schools or the, the children from that school um, in, the, in the projects that we are doing for them. And that is part of giving back to the community and giving an interest to the schools or the children that are in the schools to want to become architects or engineers basically in that way because sometimes they need to see exactly what we are doing in order for them to get an interest because you know for some of um you know um especially me coming from you know a township and so on and so forth when i grew up i used to think that an engine you know engineering is about sitting in the sun the whole day and waking the whole day you know doing asphalt or laying pave or something like that and for me it wasn't attractive you know I, I needed something that is going to maybe be in an air-conditioned office or something like and i didn't know that engineering can offer you that <laughs> you know so if we go there and you tell them that actually you know what you can play on a computer the whole day and you design a road uh you can play on a computer the whole day and this is the 3d model that you're going to then you know the interest can be derived from that but i mean if you just say engineering they're talking about minds and everything like that then it's, it's too heavy for them you know they just want to become <laughs> a lawyer or something like that. so i think you know um as tut the initiative to go to communities and engage with them with the department with the help of the department of architecture basically to to do uh, community um, development and so on and so forth it it gives them interest basically in that and then they are encouraged to study maths and physics which is ultimately what we need basically to uh, develop um, technicians and technologists and engineers thank you very much no thank you um and, and godfrey um from the caesar side can you tell us about the job shadowing um and how that is reaching out to grassroots level hey thank you very much chair i wasn't expecting that one but yeah i think now for last minus 11 years uh caesar has been running uh job shadow initiative 
uh, where they ask member firms uh, to go to school and provide at least an experience or a day uh, where these learners can live the life of a consulting uh, engineer. Uh, I think it's a great initiative, which I was not exposed to, to such. I think I became an engineering technologist uh, by accident. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really amazing that people will actually go to office, go to site. And if you are job share doing in a multidisciplinary co company, you also then see the various disciplines uh, in action. I think it's a, it's a wonderful initiative. And it, it has come back now after COVID. It was disrupted a bit, uh, but now we can see the growth again. All right. No, thank you for that. Um, there's an important question on the chat, um, which maybe Hartman you can address. Um, I think um, it, it, we, we can't leave without maybe um, giving some insight here. It says, apart from the CCMA, um, where can women run to if they are faced with GBV on sites? Um, a lot of women in construction feel unsafe and are forced to rather accept the unfair sexual treatment at work because of the continuous victimization um, or to rather leave. Um, I think, you know, in addressing the, the leaking um, pipeline and leading um, um, women in engineering that um, um, our CICE CEO was addressing, these are some of the issues that are causing people to leave. Um, and, and we need to give guidance in terms of what can you do if you are in such a situation. So Jabalile, I'm not exactly certain on, of the structures that are available, but this would have to be the company that should step in, uh, the company where this lady works. But at the same time, um, the company might see the lady as reluctant to work on site because you know of this issue. Um, so there should be an a, an external party where female um, females can go and report this. I'm not sure if you know if there are structures like that. Perhaps some of the other panelists would know. Um, anyone else want to 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 add to this? Um, it goes back to that um, engineer general um, Godfrey that we keep speaking about the engineering ombudsman, <laughs> um, engineer general portfolio. Um, Karen, you you've got something to add here. Yeah. Um... Yeah, uh, um, I'll tell a story. When I went for my first job interview, I went to a big construction company and I remember I was so excited, but I had I had boots on and a skirt and I, I can't remember, obviously not dressed appropriately for a construction firm. Um, and I remember when I sat there, I was fortunate, my, my father is a, a civil engineer, so I got a lot of mentoring from him. And and I remember in my interview, the 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 guy told me that um, he said, "Yeah, but they don't really want to appoint me. It's going to be straight up before we start because I'm going to want to go on maternity leave in a few years, and they can't afford, especially on site. Look, it's it's much worse, you know, on site conditions. Like Marley said, if you're away from the office for four months, you know, it's it's difficult." But if you're away from site, I mean, uh, you know, the contract could be completed. So so it's extremely diff difficult in construction. And I remember when I got home and I told my father and he was very upset. And he told me, yeah, but we need to go to the CCMA and we need to fit because this is not on. But the problem is when we talked a bit more about it, and this is, this is the struggle she's facing, is if you go to the CCMA, I mean, I was starting my career. And the only thing that would have happened, they would have labeled me as difficult to work with. And I've seen some of the comments as well. So the problem is the next step for her is unfortunately to go to the police, which we also know in South Africa doesn't really resolve the problem. Um, uh, and and it is sad. I've, I've had a, quite a few of my old students that, that phoned me for advice. And so um, I always say, you know, if respect is not served at the table, you need to get up and leave. And and 
site conditions is hard and I always feel you you need to try at least for a few months but if you've been trying and it's three to six months then maybe you need to leave because if you're working for a company that's not protecting you it's not going to get better then um and I'm gonna address the elephant in the room what I've seen from my own experience it's even harder for black ladies on site than it is for white ladies and and so it's very unfortunate, but I don't think if they are not doing, if the company is not doing anything about it now, um, if, and even if she goes to the CCMA, they are going to treat her differently. So it would be, be better to actually look for other employment. And that is what is sad about the situation for herself. It would be better to move, but why should she? Yeah. So again, I think my advice would be if, if your organization is not doing anything about this, um, try to reach out um, to other structures, um, whether it be the champions of gender diversity and equality, whether in SISI or, or, or CISA, and, and see what advice you can get there. I think we it's time we address these issues and not leave them unresolved because then it just continues. Um, and a, a few good examples need to be made um, to um, send the message that this is unacceptable. Um, Harman, you wanted to contribute here? I just want to add in, I think this is where the men in our industry should step in. This is where we should step strongly to the fore and assist um, in, in this situation. You know, if it's not the company, then the men at that company should be allies. No, thank you very much. Um, so we are officially out of time, um, but I just want to put everyone at ease in terms of the questions that we have received, um, as well as um, the other comments and questions that we have received in the chat. We have been taking notes. We're going to summarize all of this, um, and we will email it out um, as just a summary of the discussion that we had today. Um, in terms of some of the questions that were posed to the SICE CEO, um, she did respond, just the message has come through to the delegates. Um, so we will make sure, um, Francis, um, that you receive um, your um, um, response as well, um, as well as um, the other questions that we got from Carabello um, and um, Hein. I see there was some discussions from you. So we will get back to you after this um, in terms of what we can answer. And we just want to, again, open dialogue. Please let us know, is there something that CESA, SISI, EXA can do um, to address um, these issues, um, to address the leaking pipeline, to address the grassroots level? Do you have bright ideas? What, what are your companies doing um, that we can adopt um, and try to make engineering attractive and to make it attractive, not just for males, but for females as well. I'm gonna leave just 30, 30 seconds each, um, my panelists to just um, take home the nugget of the day, um, any message that you want to convey in closing. And I will start with Marilee. Thank you, yeah, so my 30 seconds, I guess the biggest thing is talk to your children um let's start young let's let's just have this dialogue and just prove to them that it is there's nothing funny about women in engineering or any other mathematics or science-based degrees it's just normal so all the other things I feel you know if, if we change this way of thinking and it becomes more of a normalized issue then that's that's a way to start and we must start young start at home thanks Marilee yeah. Um, let's go to Mishak, your final closing words. Uh, thank you. I think uh, um, I'll follow on the words of Marily. It's uh, basically testimony. Um, you know, we need to talk and testify more about the wonders um, that engineering does to young female. Um, you know, um, unfortunately enough that I sometimes I teach first years and, and final years. That first year, uh, you know, is, is to show them that it, um, engineering can actually work. Um, so that they don't even drop out because, you know, sometimes they get into the system and they leave the system because of all those things. So testimony, testify, testify, testify. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Darren? Well, well, first, just uh, thanks to CISA for having this platform. I think a lot of people that have joined in have actually 
have been made aware of the situation as well of, of, the, of their thoughts as well. And then thanks to all the female engineers that are still striving to stay in our industry. Well done. Thanks. It's, it's great to have you guys. Thank you, Darren. Um, that's also just appreciation and acknowledgement. Um, it, it goes a long way. There was a question, what can male, how can males add to this and make things better? But thank you for that. Um, An allyship, right? Just to have a male ally um, helps um, in terms of pursuing and perseverance. Thank you for that. Let me go to um, Harman. I'm going to just steal the screen one last time and make the most of my 30 seconds. <laughs> so there's three aspects. Mentors, we need to open up. We need to step up. We need to make this part of our discussion. This shouldn't be a topic that is not discussed. We should discuss this with our female mentees. And then also, any females out there in our industry, ladies, you need to step to the fore as mentors. Very important uh, for others to see you there. Then secondly, men, be allies. We need, uh, men need help on this topic. So, you know, we need more help than we're willing to admit. But I think ladies, you can be um, sure or certain that there are more allies in men than you might think. But the discussion is muted. And then men should be mentored as well to uh, flip the script and be aware of the situation with ladies. And then just lastly, the woman, Lean In. There's a fantastic book by Cheryl Sandberg. She's the previous COO of Facebook. She, her advice is for ladies to lean in, lean into situations that you feel put you at risk of, of failing or looking foolish or situations that might ruffle feathers. Lean into your ambitions and flip the script. Thanks. Thanks, that's, that's beautiful. Um, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate that challenge to all of us to be mentors that step up to promoting our industry better. Thank you, Harman, for that. Um, and lastly, um, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so um, the problem is with engineering is that if we as engineers do our work, work properly, then society functions very, it flows. So I always say people only complain about something if a service doesn't work, if the road is in disrepair. If So if we do our work properly, nobody really appreciates what we do for a living because, and I mean, that was in COVID, we saw that we were not seen actually as a, as a service that, uh, you know, was, you know, medical doctors were seen as important, but we weren't. And so that comes back to, I think, grassroots for me is you always, everybody wants to become a lawyer because they watched Suits or they watched Grey's Anatomy, but you never see, I always tell my students, have you seen a movie where the civil engineer is the hero? <laughs> we haven't. <laughs> um, so I'm not saying we should maybe, start, CISO maybe needs to start making some movies about us, but the thing is, we will have to find a way to, to get to the grassroots if we want if you want to, to get more engineers out, male or female. Um, thanks, Arman, for your comments. And, and yes, I know the bro code. And, and fortunately, there are a lot of guys like you that's willing to mentor and help out women. And they, you know, they see it from both sides. And I think what happens when you're married and you see how your wife was struggling or you've got kids and you know, oh, this is, this is a, something my daughter is going to struggle with, then it's something that you feel very passionate about. So thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to, to everyone, um, especially um, our attendees who have been active and participating um, and putting comments. Um, great ideas on there about school competitions, about paternity leave, about mentoring men to be better allies, um, and to just about um, getting more um, females, um, giving them more hope 
um, to persevere and stay on the industry. So I just want to say thank you and to the panel panelists as well. Thank you very much for your time. This was, uh, for me, I, I found this very worthwhile um, conversation that we need to carry on. Yes, it might sound like a cliche, it's Women's Month, we're doing this, but it is the aim of um, the um, Gender um, Diversity Forum of CESA to continue the dialogue beyond Women's Month. So um, we will take these and we will um, see if we can have more focused webinars addressing per topic. I understand right now it's quite a lot all over and we thought we we're gonna narrow it down with just professional registration, but there are bigger issues that ultimately affect this. So thank you very much. And please um, continue the conversation, reach out to us by email, reach out to Godfrey, um, and we'll be able to um, answer more questions. So thank you and goodbye to everyone.